Madhukar, Media Representative at Frontless Media. So I welcome you all to this session. We have gathered here today to celebrate the Pragati Evichar Literature Festival 2023. This year's theme of PVLF is taking humanity forward. And under this theme, we have a sub-theme, children and storytelling. To discuss this theme, today's session topic is Raising Curious Minds. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have Chitwan Mitchell, Vinas Gandhi and Sonida Sangvi to share their insights on this topic. Okay. So I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, let me, uh, Thank you for having uh, us. Uh, let me start with a brief introduction with, of Chitwan Mitchell. Uh, she holds a degree in, uh, in English education from Boston University and an MA in Values in Education from the University of London. She is a published author with titles such as Education for the Complete Person, Satya Upanishad, and The Argument for the Existence of God. Actively involved in children's education since 2005, she was a part of the community that established that Indian, the Indian Institute of Teacher and the Children's University by the government of Gujarat, India. Her books encourage and engage engagement and diversity and, the, and focus on value-oriented education. She lives between India and Singapore with her husband and two sons, who are her constant source of inspiration. As for our uh, next panelist, we have Vinil Gandhi, who is CEO of the Learning Curve Academy and the founder of Gamified Financial Education Program. Through this program, Binal has engaged with over 20,000 youth and conducted over 100,000 hours of teaching at leading corporates, colleges, and schools across India. She has worked for close to 20 years in the years in the areas of corporate finance and mergers and acquisitions at companies like GE Capital and Wells Fargo. As senior vice president in charge of merger and acquisitions at Wells Fargo, Binal led teams that resulted in acquisitions worth over 1 billion. Vinil has two daughters ages 13 and 18 who have been a strong source of inspiration for her work in financial education. For our next panelist, Sonira Sangvi. Sonira Sangvi is a writer, education consultant and a former lawyer. She has written content for a wide range of clientele including several leading multinational companies she has also co-founded an education consultancy, High Sky Company, which helps students craft standout college application essays. Prior to that, she worked as assistant director at Business India Magazine. She worked as a lawyer in New York before moving to India in 2011. She's a mom of two kids, age three and seven. So let us begin with our session. Uh, I have first question for uh, Chitwan Mittal. Peace with Buddha and service with Guru Nanak teach children valuable lessons through vibrant illustration. What was your idea behind incorporating uh, deities in your books to inculcate values in children? So uh, I think living abroad and raising my children here, I felt that there was a lack of uh, books that introduced children to their culture. We live in such a vast uh, and diverse uh, culture with lots of uh, different uh, personalities, saints, scholars, philosophers that children should be introduced to and not just at a superficial level. Sometimes we just take it for granted that uh, it's around us and they will learn about it. And um, often the only thing that they learn is possibly in a history textbook, a sentence here or a sentence there, which doesn't uh, give them the depth of understanding and uh, can end up being very superficial. Um, so I wanted to create books that would uh, introduce them to the richness of our culture and uh, be able to uh, you know, kind of introduce uh, the depth of what these people said um, in, their, in their philosophies, in their uh, things. So it was, that was the main idea. I mean, we come from a generation where uh, value education was like just moral education in schools or textbooks, which was very didactic. But I think we progressed from there and we want children to be able to actually be inspired by these values and uh, not just uh, think of it as something 
that is didactic that they must do. It should become a part of who they are. And uh, picture books have a very big role to play in inspiring them for this. Uh, I must say this was a very great idea to, for you to incorporate that in, in children's books. So let us move forward with our next question, uh, which is for Vinal Gandhi and Son uh, Sonira Gandhi. Okay. So why is imparting financial literacy to kids imperative in today's world? Mm -hmm. Since you have written Piggy Bank to portfolio, how to raise financial you know, smart kids. So why is it imperative in today's world? I want to know. Uh, I'll go first. Okay. So um, let me, um, you know, start off from the values uh, part since uh, Chitpant was talking about that. Um, so all of us parents want to instill values in our children. And, you know, we focus on honesty and hard work and respecting our elders, helping others. Uh, but most of us don't necessarily focus on money related values. In fact, when we were doing research for our book, Piggy Bank to Portfolio, 64% of the parents said that they wish they'd learn more about money and money-related values uh, when they were younger. And most of them want to teach their kids about money, but uh, don't necessarily know, uh, you know where to start. So, um, so and, and, you know, I work with kids through my financial literacy initiative and I have two teenage daughters and ch children have a very curious mind and they have lots of questions. So Sonira and I have um, written this book, um, Piggy Bank to Portfolio, to, uh, to help parents and uh, to, um, you know, help them answer some of the difficult questions that uh, the kids may ask about money and to also give them practical ways in which they can teach their children about uh, money as they start out. And uh, when it comes to financial literacy, uh, one of the most important things is starting early. Um, and you know, financial habits start very earlier on in life. And, um, and, and so, you know, parents do need to get started a lot earlier to help their kids develop these values. Okay. Um, you know, for me, it was very personal. I, I'm, I, I've, this is a conversation I've had with Binal very often that I wasn't taught much about finance as a kid. It was always, it's good to save money, uh, but no one ever said what to do with those savings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me, I wanted my children to have that foundation from a very young age and sort of, you know, that I didn't want them to make the same mistakes that I did at 25 when I started earning money and I didn't know what to do with it or how to save or how to invest. So that was the number one, um, you know, sort of idea behind the book. But the other thing is also, I think we live in a world of overabundance. And I, I understand this comes from a place of privilege, but, you know, it, it's a parenting tendency to want to give your kids the world. But we also sort of then encourage them to end up you know, giving them more toys. They get so much stuff at birthday parties. They get Christmas gift and Halloween gift and Diwali gift and Tooth Fairy. And, you know, we, we literally try to cram as many experiences as possible. But what also happens as a result is that kids tend to think that this is normal and this is how life is, which it is not, right? And so uh, somewhere I wanted to sort of pause that and, and make them realize that behind all the luxuries that they have or things that they think come easy, there's actually a lot of hard work and uh, money is to be valued and not taken for granted. So th those were pretty much the, the two biggest considerations behind the book. Okay. Uh, so let us move forward with our next question, which is for all of you. So how did the idea of composing books that imbue values in children cross your mind? I think uh, that is what we've been saying. The idea is at this age that we want to introduce children to values in a way that will inspire them um, so that it's not something that they pick up here and there from a movie or, you know, they find their, their goal in life or the value that kind of uh, guides them through a song or a, or a movie or, you know, it is done in a more conscientious way. Uh, little more deliberately, but uh, done in a way that is uh, 
uh, inspiring and not didactic. So if we can have more publishers creating books that will be, whether it is to teach uh, value about uh, finances or values about, uh, you know, just universal uh, values that are uh, like peace or uh, kindness or service, uh, we want to introduce these early. So they become a part of uh, the child's inner being. Okay, so in, uh, in your opinion, should these books be included in school curriculum? Uh, for me, I mean, the kind of books I am creating, picture books, I don't think it should be part of the curriculum in the sense that they should be tested upon or that the child should be made to memorize. It kind of uh, takes away from what we are trying to do. But definitely they should be part of children's life, the school libraries. They should be part of book fairs and book festivals. They should be used in classrooms by teachers just as storytelling and uh, just in circle time to spark conversations uh, between the teachers and children uh, at bedtime uh, with parents. A lot of parents have come back and said, you know, these books have managed to start a conversation on how can we be kind. Let's think of ways and, uh, and uh, means by which you can be kind in your daily lives. So we want them to be something which is uh, more spontaneous and natural. Uh, definitely, this is something that should be part of a curriculum in a more uh, subtle way, not in the way that, you know, this year we're going to teach kindness and, and then let's test how kind the children are. That is not something that uh, we uh, would advocate. Okay. I, I think financial literacy should definitely be part of uh, the school curriculums. And I think a lot of schools are uh, doing quite a bit to get there. But, uh, but financial literacy is not just about knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's also about values. It's about habits. Um, and the reality is parents play a very big part when it comes to inculcating some of these values as well as instilling some of these habits. So, um, so for financial literacy, you know, it needs to be done in partnership between the schools uh, as well as, you know, with the parents. So do you think that financial literacy helps in the overall development of a child? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, there's a Dunedin study. It's a very famous study that, uh, you know, it, it tracks kids from when they were very young, about six, seven years old, up until their 40s. And, uh, you know, it, it shows that kids who are able to delay gratification, who are able to resist, uh, you know, a piece of candy that's in front of them, actually uh, do much better later on in life because uh, those things, those traits such as discipline, delayed gratification is what affects their ability later on in life to save, to invest, to compartmentalize decisions. These are the kids who in their forties had uh, managed to save up for a house, had saved up for retirement. So, you know, parents focus on so many things when the kids are younger, such as education or exposure or manners or even religion, you know, but for some reason, they put off conversations about money until the kids are 16, 18, 20. The truth is that money uh, saving and money forming habits actually start or develop in a child by the age of seven, because the qualities such as discipline and delayed gratification are often already developed in a child by age seven. So then to start it at age 16 or 18, those uh, personality uh, of that child has already formed to a large extent. And that's not to say that it won't matter that you know once you've not done it at seven, you shouldn't do it at 18. But all I'm trying to say is that if you start early, then that significantly affects their money related behavior later on in life. And the truth is that money and finance affect every single thing we do in life, right? Like even if you hate it, even if you love it, the house you live in, the kind of job you have, the kind of car you drive, every single thing, the vacations we take come down to our ability to spend on that. And not just money, even time, right? The, the kind of time that we can have to ourselves or dedicate to things that truly matter in life also affect our financial uh, decisions. So. Uh, this is why it's really important to teach the value of money and financial education and values and literacy from a young age. Okay, so uh, with our next question, uh, how does storytelling influence the holistic development of a child? How does it affect 
uh, their overall growth, uh, their cognitive abilities? How does it affect them? So we've all heard that uh, the child's uh, mind grows the most in its first year. Uh, the brain doubles in size and in the first five years, uh, maximum brain development is happening. So this is where storytelling and reading picture books comes uh, plays a major part uh, because books are multi-sensory. And when there's read alouds happening, the child is able to hear the story and see the pictures and even touch and smell the page. So it is able to make all those connections in the brain. And there is also, this is a very crucial time for uh, language development. And uh, it helps the child hearing the story being told, helps the child make those connections with language, uh, can make the connections between sounds and words and use of tone. And uh, of course, vocabulary development as well. A lot of the picture books are, uh, focused on building on vocabulary, introducing new vocabulary. Um, there are so many things it helps to develop focus when they are when they have to listen to a story from beginning to end to be able to retain that focus is uh, such a huge skill that will serve them in their lives. And memory development, when you re redo the story again and again, very often mothers will repeat that story even in schools They'll do the story again and again till the child is al almost able to remember it and repeat, uh, you know, from memory. So that early memory development is also so important. Uh, there are so many, so many cognitive uh, benefits of storytelling at a young age. And um, emotional development, I think the most important one that I feel is that they are able to develop a sense of empathy. So when they are able to connect with one character and say, you know, they, you can hear children say, oh, like if the child, get, the character gets hurt or drops an ice cream, they are able to connect. Even if they know that character is not real, even if it's an inanimate object, like could be a train, but it's personified. They are able to feel that sense of empathy and connect with that uh, character. I think that is a huge, uh, plays a huge part in their emotional development. And uh, I mean, there's also social development, understanding society, how things work around uh, uh, to understand the context that they're living in, cultural ethos, um, and so important for family bonding. They are able to uh, spend that very special quality time with their parents. And um, yes, so I think storytelling and picture books and... Uh, are extremely important for the holistic development of children. Uh, I mean, they sure are very, uh, they sure are a big part of our lives. And we have been uh, hearing stories since we were child. So uh, you were saying something, Vinod? Oh, I was just going to say, I think all of us, I think our oldest memories are listening to stories, right? From our parents or for, from our grandparents and uh, I think it's one of the oldest forms of teaching as well as learning um, you know and it goes back thousands of years mm -hmm. uh, it, it really helps children um, you know sparks their curiosity their imagination uh, so as uh, Chitwan said you know the benefits are many many fold. Uh, Tonira would you like to add anything? Uh, you know um, as, as, she, as Binal said, you know, it, it sparks curiosity, imagination, but also it sparks conversations, right? And mm -hmm. I have two kids, they're four and eight now, and they sit in my lap and we discuss the book after it's done. And, you know, we, we really talk about how this character fell, was this right, was this wrong? So it helps you sort of see your child's point of view sometimes on something that may be completely different from what the story had in mind. And it also sort of helps you uh, direct conversations to important topics and you know uh, this sort of leads a trajectory because later on in life if you keep this habit up my, my son is eight but even at nine or ten or twelve I want to be able to discuss things with him and have conversations with him you know whether it's related to values of um, kindness or gratitude or money or whatever it may be but the fact that children are used to discussing things with you, I think, plays a huge role in their holistic development. And it lets them know that they can have different points of view and they can openly discuss things with you. So for sure, I mean, it, it 
I, I think it's a game changer when it comes to raising kids. Okay. So while you were working on your book, Piggy Bank to Portfolio, so uh, did you find anything that was, uh, did, you, did you come across anything that was uh, in financial literacy, literacy that was, uh, that was children were find difficult to understand? Um, sure. So there are so many financial habits of ours that are very visible to our children. So for example, our spending habits. So if, if we are used to living frugally, they're observing that, they're seeing that. Um, if we're used to spending lots of money, maybe doing online shopping, again, they're observing, they're seeing, they're learning. But there are many of our other financial habits that they don't necessarily see, like saving money like investing money. It, it's, it's not that, you know, we open our passbook and, you know, show our passbook to them on a regular basis or, or you know, discuss our investment account with them on a regular basis. Um, but, uh, you know, these are some of the things certainly in a age appropriate way that parents could do uh, with their children uh, as their understanding grows so that Various aspects of financial literacy are visible to the children, not just certain habits um, and, and not the others. Um, one of the things that uh, I've seen is, uh, is very difficult for children to grasp and frankly difficult for adults to grasp is, uh, is the power of compounding. And, uh, you know, all of us in school have learned about simple interest mm -hmm. and we've learned about compound interest. Um, but what we don't understand is that small amounts of money when set aside over a longer period of time uh, does not just multiply, but it grows exponentially. Uh, and the growth is mind boggling. Um, and, and, you know, that's a concept that is very difficult for children. And, and as I mentioned, even many adults to grasp. And uh, in the book, we do suggest some ways uh, that parents can help their children understand this power of compounding, um, you know, over time. Another thing, um, in fact, in um, every finance gym class that I take, there'll always be one student who will come and say, ma'am, can you um, give us an investment where I can double my money uh, very quickly? Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole concept of understanding risk uh, that are associated with investments uh, are, are a little difficult for children to understand. But as they go along, as they grow, they do, um, you know, they do learn maybe sometimes by burning their fingers, but certainly parents can use uh, certain, um, certain games to explain them the concept of risk uh, and also use some practical examples uh, and involve them in certain household activities so that they understand these concepts slowly and surely over time. Uh, Sonia, what's your take on this? Um, I mean, I have two very young kids, so my questions usually revolve around why do we have to save, uh, you know, if I say something is very expensive, my daughter will be like, but I have three piggy banks full of money. So, uh, you know, the, the, the concepts are very different for me at, at a younger age, but for that, I mean, I, I think the hardest for me that we've dealt with is um, why is that man poor, you know, are we rich? And uh, you know, one of the, the one of the biggest things to understand when kids are asking you such questions is not that they really want to know how much money we have, because you know kids don't understand or grasp those those concepts yet. But it's also about sparking deeper conversations, like why do you want to know? Uh, you know, is there a is there someone talking about money around you? Like, do you is it are you asking me because you feel like we don't have enough money? Where is this insecurity coming from? So. Uh, I think when it comes to younger kids, the important thing is not to focus on the hard concepts, but also kind of figure out the, the next step, which is why are they asking these questions and sort of take it from there and, and you know, sort of figure out what is uh, the underlying issue that's bugging them. Is it peer pressure? Is it something that they saw online? Uh, you know, is it because they feel like their self-worth is connected to money and uh, sort of take it from there and, and explain it from, like that. Uh, sure, it's a wide concept, uh, concept to, for kids to grasp. So let us move forward. And I want to ask that, uh, sorry. 
what are the what are what are some uh, some innovative approaches that we can uh, introduce to kids that can ignite their curiosity i think for me the main thing is we need to for change our approach to uh, teaching and learning before the main thing that a teacher was supposed to do was provide information to the child and that that was the main role but now the child and the parent has various sources of information and the main role the teacher has to shift that mindset that the main role is actually to spark that curiosity so if the child is uh, curious about something if you have managed to excite them and ignite that spark then that roads to learning are open and there's many many ways to uh, take it you'll see all of these uh, great teaching learning movies such as let's say the poet society what does the teacher do first he why does he climb on top of a desk and like read out a poem that he could just you know stand there and read out a poem the idea is to get the kids excited about poetry you know do something dramatic uh, open a different point of view that they might not have thought about before so the main thing is that the teacher should think of their role differently and uh, try and do whatever they can to ignite that curiosity uh, how can we at home can it, uh, help children uh, get curious about things about their surroundings how what role can we play in that i think we have so much access to materials these days uh, we shouldn't shun technology i mean i also have two young children and a lot of times uh, to get children into something there are such good movies tv shows uh, books um, so we should use all the teaching learning materials that we have out there to and whether there's there's so many games that you know if if even if it's financial literacy there are so many games you can play uh, to excite them about it as opposed to just trying to teach them something that you've decided is important uh the idea is should be to try and excite them about that topic and then once there that happens they, they will want to learn more and if the child is older they can even take that learning forward on their own um uh, through you know internet searches or books and libraries but i think parents and teachers should really see their role as finding tools that will just inspire the child in whatever direction you think is important or you want to focus on i i think um, to add to that dinner table conversations are extremely important and sometimes it's not possible for families to do that but setting aside that time just um talking about you know books movies uh, current topics um and getting their perspective uh and understanding them i think that uh, really helps them uh our kids you know with their curiosity but also helps them raise uh, awareness um and you know another thing uh, i think benjamin franklin said this but um he said tell me and i will yeah. forget teach me and i may remember but in, involve me and i will learn and um, i think it's it's really important for uh, parents as well as teachers frankly um to involve the kids give them a lot of hands on activities that they can do so that you know these are uh, lessons that will stay with them lifelong um so from a financial literacy perspective um you know involving them in some of your household decisions of course in an age appropriate way um but it goes a long way versus just you know um not sharing information with your with your children or making sort of money a non conversation or a taboo topic around your house um you know instead of doing that involving them in some of your financial decisions explaining to them why you made a decision you know a versus a decision b uh, really goes a long way in terms of uh, teaching them uh, again lifelong lessons uh, sonia would you like to add something we pretty much just what binal said you know when you talk about innovative approaches i don't think uh it's it's necessarily about innovation it's just about uh having a very hands on approach to teaching kids the stuff that you want them to teach parents are the number one influencers when it comes to their children so mm -hmm. it's so important for parents to realize that the biggest and most important thing they can do is role model the behavior they want their children to uh to sort of grow into the kind of values that you have to show the values you want your child to learn and be 
And uh, you know, one of the biggest things when we wrote our book was no one likes to read boring financial books, right? Like, I mean, unless that's your topic and that's what you want to really learn about. But the most important thing is our book was full of activities and conversations and conversation starters to have with kids that uh, you can do in daily life. So for example, you know, like I said, my son is eight. If I tell him saving is great, uh, you know, you should save, you know, it's important. He'll say, yes, yes. But what I also do is I end up taking him with me to Sakari Bandar and we're buying shampoo. And I'll tell him that I'm buying the one that has the conditioner free because that's a better deal. And it's a really small thing. It's not anything super innovative, but it's an approach to teaching your kids through your everyday life without it being boring. It's, it's just a routine thing that you're doing, but you're involving your kid and somehow telling him that I value money, this is important, and this is a way to save. Or, uh, you know, even something as simple as, uh, like I said, you know, earlier there was, there was the tooth fairy and, you know, when my son's tooth fell out, what I did was I gave him 200 rupees, but I gave him 50 rupees extra. And there was a note from the tooth fairy saying, can you pass this along to someone who needs it? And so the idea was that when you get a lot, you need to give back a lot. And so if we constantly think about how we can teach our children to give back to society, to be thankful for what they have, gratitude and giving, uh, you know, and start that from a very young age. And like I said, you know, it, it's, it's not innovative in that, you know, there's, there's a completely new concept, but it, it's just a matter of how can we weave this in into their everyday life? How do we teach them the importance of, uh, hey, you got so many birthday gifts, why don't we set some as, of your old toys aside uh, to give to people who may need them? So just constantly reinforcing these conversations in everyday activities is, I think, the best way to do it. Okay, so, uh, so thank you so much for all for joining us for this session and uh, let's uh, wrap this. So, so thank you for having us here. Uh, thank thank you for having us. Participate in thank you for having us. We had a great time. Yeah, I hope with this, uh, these, uh, uh, your insights help children uh, in their development and personal growth. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.